Hello, my name is Harold. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, episode two of Cornbread and Milk. Uh, last time I talked to you was uh, about how, how things used to be, I guess. No, no, it was Cornbread and Milk part one. Anyway, uh, my folks was stuck in the middle of the Depression. My dad was working in a cotton gin. And, you know, they only gin cotton at uh, harvest season. And harvest season is, uh, well, seasonal. So, uh, naturally, the cotton gin job ran out. And uh, my dad and my Uncle John, who was, I think, my oldest uncle, they decided to uh, catch a train and go to Kilgore, Texas. They'd heard there were jobs there. And uh, so they, you know, they did the riding the rails thing, jumped on the boxcar and went to Kilgore. And when they got there, there was 10 people for every job, at least. But while they were there, they, they heard that there was work in Houston. So they hopped another train, and on the way down to Houston, the uh, railroad detective found them on, on the train, and he threw them off at uh, Huntsville, Huntsville, Texas there. And uh, while they were in Huntsville, the sheriff picked them up, and he gave them a free meal. And I think uh, he found them guilty of vagrancy or something. He had this deputy that was supposed to haul him off somewhere. I don't know if it was in jail somewhere or haul him out of town or whatever he was supposed to do. But the deputy threw them both in the back of the car. He didn't have them handcuffed or nothing. The car didn't have any doors locked on the back. He drove on off down to town there and uh, he stopped at this cafe and told him he was going to go have some coffee. Well, they sat there in the back of that, uh, that sheriff's car for, I guess, about an hour. And they decided that maybe he wasn't ever coming back, so they just got out and hitchhiked on down to Houston. Uh, of course, it didn't do them any good. There weren't any jobs in Houston then either. So they had to, you know, ride a train back to West Texas. And uh, I imagine that it was a long period of time there. I don't uh, know a lot about happening, but uh, there is one, one story there. Uh, but my oldest brother, he was probably about 12, something like that, or 13. Still living in West Texas. And my uh, the family had a, an old milk cow, and the cow had had a calf, and it was coming time to wean the calf. So she was given less and less milk all the time. And there were, uh, let's see, yeah, there was four kids there, at least. Might have been five. I, I don't know. I had four brothers and a sister, all of them. The youngest one was at least 10 years older than me. And uh, anyway, my oldest brother had to milk the cow, but they decided to, to cut him out of the milk and just save it for the younger ones. And he got to kind of missing his milk, so then he'd go out there and, and milk the cow. He'd get a cup of milk and drink it, and then he'd get a cup of water <laughs> and pour it in the milk bucket to kind of make up for the volume there and uh, take it on in. Uh, he said he felt kind of guilty about that, but I guess a young guy wanting a glass of milk or a cup of milk <laughs> probably to do something like that. And uh, there's uh, was, was a story about one of my relatives there in West Texas. He was a young guy, and he needed a job, and he, he got a, a job as a deputy sheriff. And sheriffs can, you know, it's an interesting job being a sheriff. I guess it, it seems that the sheriff he was working for had, uh, well, let's, let's just start this back in a little bit here. Texas has uh, wet counties and dry counties, and wet towns and dry towns. And I don't mean it rains on them or don't rain on them. That means whether they're allowed to sell alcohol or not. And all the county they were in, in fact, most of the counties right around that area were dry counties. So that means there, there wasn't any place you could buy a can of beer or a fifth of whiskey or whatever you had on your mind. So the nearest place where they, that it was legal was over in Clovis, New Mexico. Well, the sheriff there, he, he ran the bootlegging business there in that part of Texas. And he had a, an old black guy that worked for him. And he'd send him over to Clovis to get a, uh, you know, his trunk of his car full of alcohol. Of various types, and he'd bring it back. And this this black guy would sell it. And if uh, the local people, you know, the uh, 
people that were teetotalers got to complaining about it, the sheriff would go out and arrest that black guy and throw him in jail for a couple of days and, and then, you know, sort of let him off uh, without any charges. And they'd start the thing all over again. Well, another guy came along that, uh, I don't know if he was a deputy or what, but he ran against the sheriff for, for a re-election there for the, the sheriff, and he got elected. And I suppose he, he intended to continue on with the bootlegging business himself. But the old sheriff, he, he didn't want to give up the business, so they found out he was heading over to Clovis to get a carload of booze coming back. So they parked out there on the road between them and Clovis. And uh, my my relative was told to get behind the, the uh, sheriff's car there with a rifle just in case the old ex-sheriff didn't want to be arrested or anything. They, he was a pretty tough old guy, and they were a little bit afraid of him, you know. And uh, so they, they stopped the, the old sheriff and, and arrested him for bootlegging. And I, I think the new sheriff finally took the business over. I'm not sure. Everything's kind of vague about that. But uh, anyway, that was, <laughs> that was the uh, story of, of the uh, local bootlegger. One of, uh, one of my earliest memories was... Uh, out in West Texas there. Uh, I remember watching a couple of my brothers and my father out in the sandstorm changing a flat on the car. I mean, that's, that's a strange thing to remember, but I remember watching that. And I remember playing in a house with a, a, a toy John Deere tractor and a, a little set of rakes behind it or something. And some salesman or something like that came to the door and knocking on the door and wanted me to go get my parents. And I told him, nope, wasn't going to do it. He stood there a long time knocking and I guess he's getting pretty mad at me. I never did go tell anybody he was at the door. My mother finally heard him and come to the door. And, uh, of course, she wanted to know why. Why didn't I tell her? That I didn't have any really good reason. Just a dumb kid. And uh, another memory after that was I remember my, uh, my youngest brother was driving a tractor with a cotton picker on it. And he was pulling the trailer behind it. And the cotton picking thing was, you know, pulling the the cotton bowls off the vines and blowing them up to shoot into that trailer. And I rode around on the tractor with him a while and I got kind of cold and tired. So he, he put me back in that trailer full of cotton, you know, with my coat wrapped around me. And he covered me up with cotton except for my head sticking out. And, and uh, I remember it was it was kind of dusty and those cotton burrs were poking and sticking me, but it, it was still was warm and and I got a good nap back there in that cotton trailer. Uh, somewhere after that, they they wound up in, in Houston. Actually, they wound up in Pasadena, and uh, which is a little town next to Houston. And it was a strawberry growing place at the time. But anyway, they, they wound up there, and my dad got a job in the shipyard, welding. And this was, you know, I guess maybe 1940 or... 41 somewhere and this is during World War II and uh, they were trying to you know make enough money to go and get another farm so after school and during the summer my two oldest brothers would work in the shipyard as welders and finally uh, in 1945 somewhere uh, 44 long toward the end my oldest brother got old enough for the army he got out of high school I don't know if he volunteered or got drafted, but uh, they shipped him off to, to Europe. They, uh, the war in Europe was already over, uh, and they were they were planning on invading Japan. And my brother said he, he felt like his name was on the list to you know put him on the ship and head him to Japan, and that that would have been a bad deal because the Japanese had sworn that they'd fight to the last man, woman, and child, which meant that you know, He'd probably a million ca casualties on each side, you know, easy. And he said that uh, when they dropped the atomic bomb, that he figures that saves his life because there would have been a lot of soldiers died trying to, you know, take over the mainland of Japan. Uh, anyways, uh, during that time, while while they were living there in Pasadena, my old my brother, just older than me, he uh, he he didn't like to go to school too much. He, he liked to go out and go fishing and whatever. So he had skipped school. And my dad would come home from work, find out he had skipped school or wasn't home yet. 
send my two oldest brothers or maybe the three older ones out to find him and they'd bring him home kicking and scratching and biting you know because he, he wasn't going to cooperate with that either and my dad would go out and pull a switch off of the little tree out in the front yard and give him a good whipping with it apparently it didn't impress my brother much at all because they say that my, my dad killed that tree tearing off switches and spanking him for all the stuff he was always getting into he was he was, he was a real scrapper. He was always getting into fights and stuff. Later on, uh, when he got into high school, he got into boxing. Uh, while my folks were living in Pasadena, they uh, they had a guy, that, a, a local peddler. He had a tamale man. He had a little push cart that he, you know, pushed down the road selling hot tamales. And my folks liked them a lot. They, every time they come by, they'd buy a bunch of tamales and, uh, you know, mix them in with the meal. Good stuff. And uh, after some time went on, they heard uh, that the folks down at the local dog pound had got to wondering why that this uh, guy was adopting so many dogs. And uh, it turns out that. Uh, his hot tamales were more hot dogs than anything else. He was uh, he was taking those dogs home and uh, <laughs> he was cooking them up in hot tamales. You know, he grind them up in there. And so I guess I guess dogs can't be too bad tasting. I never have had one. I wasn't I wasn't born yet during you know during that time. But uh, I came along just just before they left Pasadena, Texas, just long enough to get a birth certificate from there. At least I had one, but that's something my third oldest brother couldn't say. Uh, but anyway, if you uh, if you wonder sometimes if what you're eating is a dog <laughs> or something else, it might be, but uh, they don't taste all that bad, I guess, because my folks like them. The next thing I remember after that was being in Oklahoma. My uh, my second oldest brother and my oldest brother were both going from home. My, my second oldest brother had got in the Navy. And this was during uh, the Korean War. He was on a destroyer. And he said they would set out, I think he said, in Tonkin Bay. I don't know. I'm not sure of the, the details of it. But anyway, there was a, a railway bridge that came out of a tunnel on one side, out of a mountain, you know, and crossed this cavern, you know, this uh, canyon, and went into a tunnel on the other side, you know. And he said every hour they'd put a five-inch shell on that railway bridge. And then the, the, the North Koreans would come running out, put the bridge back together, and run off out of the way, you know, in time to miss the, the next hourly five-minute shell. He said one night they did shoot a train off that, uh, that bridge that you know was coming through. Uh, during that time, he got a leave in Hong Kong, and they told him, not to eat any of the local food, and I guess he's probably like the rest of us, uh, stubborn. And uh, so he got hungry down in town, and he ate something there. And next thing you know, he had uh, hookworms. You know, and they had to put him in the in the infirmary there and feed him whatever kind of poison you feed people to kill hookworms. And uh, I remember he got a he, he got a a chest and some other things when he was there in Hong Kong. I'm pretty sure that's where he bought them. Nicely carved and stuff. I remember him having that his whole life. Uh, my brother, just uh, just down number three, he had uh, he'd grown up later on, and I sometime, uh, I guess, sometime in the probably the the late fifties, not much after the time that my second oldest brother was in the in the uh, navy. He decided he wanted to go to college, and he went off to Oklahoma City or someplace, and uh, went, went to taking some kind of college courses. And he got hungry while he was there. I guess he had misfigured all the expenses, and he went down and joined the Navy. They'd give him a meal ticket that day, and they did, and they promised to send him to school and stuff. And so, I guess they didn't worry too much about what they promised because they, they were—he was in the Navy for for a bit, and he kept bothering them about, well, you promised you were going to send me to school. And they'd put him on KP and all kind of things and picking up scraps. And he was getting punished all the time for bothering them about that. And then they finally sent him to school and 
got he got in to maintain a radar station somewhere there in Japan, I think in Hokkaido, and he married one of the local girls and brought her home. I remember when he did that, we were it was after my dad had died the time he came home because I think he stayed. He was in Japan about six years after he had got out of the Navy. I think he stayed there for that long. So, it was, you know, pretty good time in between the time he went in and the time he came back. This is probably about enough for one time. Uh, next week I'll tell you about uh, more bootleggers and uh, such there in, in Oklahoma. I don't know. But I'm sure I haven't told you that yet. And... Uh, that's that's one of the happiest places I was as a little kid wandering around in the woods there. So uh, well, thank you for for watching. And uh, next week we'll have more bootleggers. This time it won't be the sheriff. These guys will be on the other side.